Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30 day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash farside. Over 150,000 titles are available to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. And you may also go to thefarside.tv slash audible. From the valleys of Tennessee and breaking through the barriers of perceived reality, you have now crossed over to the far side. And welcome back to the program, everyone. On today's edition, our guest is Jackie Barrett. Jackie has been a psychic medium for more than 24 years. She has clients all over the world, including celebrities in the music and entertainment industries, politicians, and professional athletes. In late 2007, Jackie was chosen to compete in Lifetime Network's America's Psychic Challenge, in which she finished a close second. And Jackie was also the star of her own television series called Medium P.I., where she and Sean Crowley, the captain of Code Case Homicide of New York PD, help to solve code cases on the A&E channel. Jackie also has several books out. You can find those by going to thefarside.tv slash Jackie Barrett. J-A-C-K-I-E-B-A-R-R-E-T-T. And that will take you directly to Jackie's Amazon page. And if you listen to this program, but you are not subscribed to it just yet, there are multiple venues where you can subscribe. I think right now the top places, I don't know what the top places are for the Android marketplace, but for iOS devices, you can go to thefarside.tv slash subscribe. And there's also Stitcher Radio, TuneIn Radio that we are available on. And like I said, I know we're available through some Android applications. I'm not exactly sure what their podcast applications are. But if anyone that gets this program through an Android application, if you would send me an email, let me know exactly what application you're using to to get this podcast. I will actually mention that on there as well. With that said, let's bring Jackie on the line. Jackie, welcome to The Far Side. Oh, thank you. It's great to have you here with us. Same here. First thing I do want to touch on for just a minute so that the listeners will know some about you. Okay. How long have you been a psychic? Has it been most of your life? Yes. Um, the, the first time, well, I was born into it. Um, my mother was a medium and a mortician. And so growing up on, with one foot on the other side, um, I actually uh, helped participate in seances by the age of five hmm. and realized uh, my gifts uh, between seven and eight years old and used them uh, since I was a teenager, so most of my life. Wow. And then working with um, NYPD captain um, for 20 years, his whole career. What what was it like being five years of age and doing seances? Um, You know, it's it's like um, when you hear that children say that you think everybody else lives that way when they were abused and, and what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, it was sort of like that, but but I I did know that the uh, the neighboring kids um, uh, feared us and uh, did not do the same things. Um, it was it was frightening, but 
as as long as I could remember, I was seeing the dead. Uh, I was seeing them pass by my room, and and at that time in Louisiana, um, our home uh, was the back of the house was the the mortuary, the Palermo's mortuary. So I sort of grew up with all of that stuff. Wow. And yeah, so it um I had my share of panic attacks as a child. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> and still do. <laughs> um so it's um it was frightening and you know it's it's not something like bedtime was a a fearful time for me because my father uh, was native. He was Blackfoot and a uh, medicine man, and and he had a, a huge impression on my life, and uh, as well, and you know, taught us um, all that we shouldn't fear the unknown. Um, but it was awfully hard when the lights went out, <laughs> 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 and you know, we were. We were told, you know, to to face your fear, and um, there was no nightlight, so mm-hmm. it was scary. <laughs> oh, I bet it was. Yes, yes, indeed. Here, in my life, I've had experiences myself. I don't consider myself psychic, but I've heard uh, disembodied voices talking to me. Oh, actually, you're, um, Bob, uh, you see... There's there's psychics and there's different levels of psychics, but you um you're actually a medium. Oh, okay. You are actually a medium, and when you know people say, "Well, how am I a medium when I can't see the dead?" Um, you don't have to necessarily see with um your eyes. Uh, I I have I was always able to to see them. And and I think it was because of the in, intense um, learning from from my family and and opening up these um, these invisible doors. Uh, but the first thing that people don't realize is that there are many of us out there on different on different levels of what we can do, um, and hearing the voices. Um, is part of mediumship because it's a way of communication. Mm -hmm. Now, is that something that you just picked up off of me, or was that something that you just thought because I had said that I have heard? No, absolutely not. Um, Actually, I never ask my assistant, um, who is uh, my adult daughter, um, what am I going to be doing that day because I try to uh, not so far in advance, like usually that day, mm-hmm. because um, I I tend to um, astro travel very easy, and have taught this to to many people and some people that I shouldn't have. Um, and when she showed me, I was uh, I was like, okay, so he's a medium, so this is going to be fun, and I'm going to forget about my my throat infection and have a good time with this. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and I hope you do start to feel better. I can tell oh, it hurts it's, a bit. It's, yeah, it's just the weather. You know, it's um, being in air conditioner a lot and, and just, like, running around. And mm-hmm. um, and it's been really, really humid in New York. Now, I do have a question for you. Last night, my wife gets up early sometimes, so I sleep on the couch because I toss and turn. I tend to do that. Mm-hmm. But last night... It was about midnight, a little after midnight, and I started hearing knocks at the door, at the front door, and nobody was there. Wow. Every time I'd go to sleep. Yeah. And I have no idea what that yeah. could be. D- do you have any insight? Yes. Usually um, when that happens, and that has happened in our home a lot, in many of our homes, um, and sometimes it doesn't even have to be at the front door. It could be the bathroom door when you're in there or the garage door, um, it's, you know, they're letting you know um, that their presence is around. And people often say, well, if you open a door, you let them in. Guess what? They don't need that. They can come in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they, can, 
they'll find their way in. But they're, you know, when they keep trying to communicate with uh, someone, you know, like yourself, and do you have um, problems where they would call it like sleep paralysis? I don't anymore. There was a time where I used to, like when I was a child, but that okay. was about it. Yeah, and and right away, you know, they try to put a medical term um, to a lot of these things, and mm -hmm. science has proved it, and I think um, the studies in Russia were first, and then Germany, um, or maybe it was Germany first, if I'm not mistaken, but the... Um, <laughs> The whole thing with sleep paralysis is that when people do experience this, they're, they're opened. And opened meaning um, they are gifted. And there is something coming close to them, whether to communicate, uh, sometimes not so nice, and other times, um, you know, we can take it as not being good. Uh, because when the spirit does come close to us, it does put us into either a frozen state or like something is pressing on us or, uh, you know, when, when it, it isn't so nice, um, we wake up with marks and bruises mm -hmm. or like we were being choked or held up in the air and then thrown down. But the, uh, the more common of, um, communication amongst young mediums and I've spoken to hundreds of um, children with their parents like this and and separate incidences and and you know children that are not outcasted or or walk around with black makeup on or anything that would leave them to for skepticism you know um, they they felt as though they were being pushed down into the bed and they couldn't breathe and they knew they were aware of what was going on around them um you know so there there are several things and and i remember um as a child um having some horrific experiences like this and it was just as I was starting school, so you figure around five years old, because I was born at the end of the year, um, so uh, I would have this, um, I would, first I would see, like, it would look like the, the, the whole wall started to swirl a little, as though the, there was a haze, a hot haze, onto the, the, the bedroom wall. And I would watch it, and it would start moving faster and faster, and something was opening. And then I would have this horrible feeling of um, many hands uh, squeezing uh, my, my small body as a child, like your legs and your arms. And, and I, I do remember, you know, we had strict rules in our house, and... Um, Mary, my mother, was one not to be reckoned with and you didn't get out of bed when you were supposed to be in bed. And I, I remember getting up and it was as though every bone in my body was broken and I couldn't stand upright. And my legs felt like they were dragging and, and the squeezing pains were just horrific. And that went on for quite some time and it actually decreased when I started uh, participating in the family's rituals of the old world seances. Mm. So be it they were coming and, and touching and trying to make themselves known, and it can be painful. Mm -hmm. Especially to a younger child. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, the only way I remember describing it, you know, like trying to wake my father up quietly um, and one time even crawling on the floor um, was that I, I told him that I felt like my whole body was clay and being like molded into something else. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, that could be a horrifying event. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. But, you know, I've opened myself up to um, to the other side and um, used different tools as well mm-hmm. to um, communicate, and that always helps. See, I think that's the difference between us. I've had these experiences all my life when I was young, and then I just started to shut it out because I didn't want it. Yeah. Honestly, it scared me. I I was a kid, and I would see these beings in the shadow. I would hear these voices, Mm -hmm. etc. And even as a teenager, you you would see a shadow figure hanging outside your window at night, up in the air, waving at you, knocking on the window. I mean... That was just not something that was a part of my family that we talked about, at least. So I just shut it out. Exactly. That's what it is. I think, um, you know, growing up in old Louisiana is uh, really different. And even now, you know, when tourists go there, I mean, I I still keep my Louisiana roots, but I, I'm in New York and have been for a better part of my life. But um, it's... <laughs> Everywhere you go, there's an underbelly of the occult. Mm-hmm. And, and not necessarily, I'm not talking about anything like everyone thinks of it as like, you know, voodoo dolls and sticking pins in it and doing bad <laughs> things. Um, it isn't like that at all. It's, it, it's more of the fear of what could really happen. And um, we... At, at least us, we, we did everything to protect and uh, did rituals and did spells and and call on to the guards. And and it was very close to, you know, my, my father's belief as a medicine man um, because we, we believe in giving back and then um, giving to the earth and, and what have you. So for for me to have these abilities and say... Um, absolutely not. I am not participating. Um, there would be very high consequences to that. Mm. So <laughs> you participated. Yeah. Well, what kind of consequences are we talking about? Some kind of a psychic punishment? or um, It was more straight up and down uh, punishment. Um, and, you know, I... Um, my mother was... I, I say my mother now because she has passed, but... Like, we weren't allowed to call her that. Um, we had to call her by a first name. And um, there was um, many of nights, many, many of nights with uh, without dinner or, you know, just tossed into the room. And, and I knew my closet very well. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, yeah, it was ruled by the Iron Fist. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you this. Being a... S- that you are a psychic or a medium where you can see dead people, correct? Yes. Okay. And you can also speak with them. Yeah. What type of spirits are we looking at here on this plane? There are human spirits. What other types of spirits? There are um, some that haven't been born. Um, And, you know, they say, well, would that be considered human? Well, that, you know, there's, um, there are people that come in form of angels, um, and, and I'd like to consider them, the ones that I have met, um, that yes, indeed, they were, they were here. They did walk the earth, and, and you know, they come back to help. Um, and, and then there are legions of demons. Um, and then you have the angels that are fighting their own war with these demons. Uh, and I have witnessed many of these types um, pass through ordinary people on an ordinary street on just an ordinary day. So there, there are many. And I have um, also witnessed um, the spirits go through animals, and I myself and um, got this from my my father's side uh, have animal guides and uh, spirit totems, and and we are giving this at birth, 
and mine was the wolf and then and, and you you wear this mojo bag and you know you carry the spirit with you mm-hmm. uh so i have um had this conversation with many of animals uh just by looking at them uh a telepathy uh type of of thing now there are many other things that i haven't come across you know um i've been questioned uh about the um extraterrestrial uh you know ufos mm-hmm. and, and so forth i don't count anything out um i personally spoke with and and had the um honor of meeting a retired air force um general and he had told me things and and confidential and uh so it wasn't just like you know somebody on the street or somebody that forgot to take their meds or anything like that mm-hmm. i mean we are talking about you know intellectual people that have dealt with and saw certain things and um believe that they are walking amongst us um and come in spirit form as well Here, here's a question for you. you may not have an answer for it but since i've got a psychic on the line may as well ask okay okay the question is did elvis presley actually die yes. have you looked into that he did yes yes and i know um you know i i'm a huge fan of of him and um Elvis himself if you look into you know I say the occult and people think right away is something bad it isn't anything anything that's out of the norm of um the religious aspect is considered the occult anything in dealing with the dead is considered that mhm and uh he himself um uh did rituals uh protection rituals um long to uh speak with his uh deceased mom uh who he was very close with had a tremendous amount of guilt um with uh the, the passing of his twin brother at birth mm-hmm. um Jesse uh you know who um he felt that you know he was uh, cheated out of a life and he was granted so much but uh I know he definitely did prosperity work and I know there are in in the American Indian um practice uh the the whole art behind some of his capes that he wore and and the American eagle uh the stones were and the gems were placed in certain ways to gain the enormous amount of strength and energy from the audience. Hmm. And, I didn't know that. Yeah, and when he would turn around and flash that open, it was like the wings open to freedom. And it would give him that drive uh to keep going. Uh so and and I have um contacted him on a personal level uh just being a huge fan and um he is um at peace and he is happy and and i know there's uh you know a lot of speculation like i even think i saw something where that there was a a young guy who is a doctor uh a medical doctor uh claiming that he's treating elvis as we yes. speak you know and you know all of this i think what happens is that we we love and we idolize um these incredible human beings uh to the point where uh, our psyche does not want to believe uh that somebody could pass like that and um and also uh we look for everything like even if Priscilla um does an interview they'll look at little words and we all make mistakes we all say oh just now um you know meaning when is something else and uh you know we're, we're human first so um i think people tend to take little things out of perspective 
and make a larger than life uh, example of it. And I think it's sort of we look at our own immortality mm-hmm. because he passed so young. Uh, but you know he um, he obviously had health problems, and you know uh, as we as we all do, the body expires and the spirit lives on. Um, but it, it would be great to have him. Um, I don't think as much as Elvis um, loved the audience and was um, very 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 um, crazy in love with his daughter. I don't think he would have stood out of the spotlight um, and and not be able to have a relationship and go undercover mm-hmm. and and risk that. Yes. Now the reason why I was asking over the years I've looked into this and about I guess it was 2008 I found a gentleman by the nickname of John Cotner. Have you ever heard of him? Yes. Yes. And. If the pictures are real, he looks a bit like him, and he sounds a lot like him. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think, as I've heard other voices from someone that's supposed to be his son, that they sound almost exactly the same. Yeah. And I'm I'm almost thinking this kid might be pretending. Yeah, and it's sad because, uh, you know what what it is, like a a true love for... For Elvis, and, and he was a, just a, a really great person, um, you know, coming from the dirt of Mississippi and, and um, just really embracing people, uh, extremely generous. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when, when you see somebody, and, and always lived it was sort of with a heartache, you know. Yep. So when, when you see something like this and you, you know the enormous amount of love out there for him, uh, it's a good way also to make money off of mm-hmm. uh, people who would love to believe or keep looking into this guy. And I also heard that they found or they requested DNA and it got lost. Mm-hmm. So do it again. It always happens. Yeah, do it again. <laughs> you know, um, I I don't think... You know, like the passion I have for my family, um, I don't think anything is worth going into hiding and missing one moment of their life. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he would do that with his daughter. I think his daughter, his mother, and even Priscilla, I I think that, um, and even his twin, his twin brother, you know, and I I don't think he would fake a death. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, they said that about Jim Morrison, too, they said, you know. Yep, exactly. And th- there's actually been a picture, I think, close to where he was buried, where they claim his ghost has shown up. I don't know if that's true or not, but with Jim Morrison. Oh, I have I have conjured uh, Jim many a times. I, I actually use um, some of his songs to, um, you know, we, we still do this... Um, this the the dance of the praise, hmm. which is um, also a firewalker dance, and I I remember as a teenager, you know, just like listening to his music and having it in my head and sort of getting in trouble all the time over it, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> I um I I did a séance um, years years back years back for. Um, it was right after uh, Kurt Cobain had, you know, passed, mm-hmm. and you know the the people who called me into this, they they were um, a heavy metal rock band, and they were sort of scared. You know, it happened here in New York City, and there was a lot of people there, and the it was the one of the um, the band members' birthday, and they wanted to call on to um, Jim, and I was like, all right, this is cool, this is really easy for me, and something else happened, and what happened was that there was, Kurt Cobain's babysitter was attending, who is now a stockbroker, and he was a guy, and he was sitting on a couch, he didn't want any part of it, and I had this round table going, and we were playing the music, and 
there was, uh, my seances are quite different. So some people were getting up and they were like, it looks like they're in this haze and um, they're hypnotized. I'm not a hypnotist. I don't know how to do that. Um, but you you have to know how to um, capture the spirit and put it into people and, and keep moving it around the table. Mm-hmm. So we had this free-flowing thing happening and the music changed and this, the song came on Come As You Are, and it was Kurt's song, and I was like, you know, who the hell did this? And what happened was that the, the babysitter, um, who was a non-believer, went into this uh, trance, and he started talking about his, um, I guess, relationship with him, like his friendship and uh, his, his, just the closeness that they had, and he only watched his kid like once or twice, but he hung out in that house, and I guess you know they were all into doing some of that, the drugs or whatever, and he was clean, and um, well, he wound up going onto the floor, and everyone was scared, and it looked like he was having a seizure, and I said just let him go, leave him, and I stood with him. And when he came out of it, and when we were talking and he was sitting up, you know, on the floor now up against the couch, he said, I had this, um, he said, first I have to tell you who I am. And then when he explained who he was to me, and he said, I didn't want any part of this because I was so open and I feared, even though I said I was a skeptic, he said, I was just fearing what could happen. Uh, he said, I remember, you know, having, I, he OD'd at one time, and he always wondered if his father was there because he lost his father right after when he was mm. in the hospital recovering. And he said, when you held my hand, and he said, you, I saw my father. He said, I saw my father, and my father was there. So he went through this whole revelation um, in front of this heavy metal band and nobody knew who he really was Uh, he was just an acquaintance of acquaintance you know so when everybody found out who he was they were like oh my god like you know what happened and he he said um, I relived the night of the the overdose and he said I was always very hurt and I thought my father rejected me mm. uh, for the long hair, for the different lifestyle and what have you. Um, and he said, I, I didn't know he was by my bedside. So I said, well, why don't you find that out? You know, like, why don't you make this like part of your mission into healing also? And this way you can let this baggage go and, and we can even do a mock burial. So three weeks later, he gets back to me and he said, um, I will never, ever doubt again. He said, I, I, I will never do this again. I will <laughs> never be part of this. I did not enjoy reliving an overdose. I did not. He said, I felt everything. But this time I was able to see things. And he said, um, he didn't speak to his dad's sister in all these years. And he called her and he went to see her. And she said, I have a picture of your father standing over you while you were on the floor, seizuring in the hospital, mm. and he was there holding your hand. So indeed, he relived this. <clears throat> so it's, um, you know, it isn't, um, it isn't anything to, to mess with, and, but I was glad that he had closure. Mm-hmm. And, you know, many people want to say, you know, our idols are um, still alive. I'm sure there are people that mock their their death and and disappear, you know, working on homicides, I know that for a fact. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, sure, you know, there are people that are murdered, definitely, definitely. We we definitely have serial killers out there that haven't been caught. And and then we have those people who don't want to be found. Yes, and you have the greats who end up taking their own lives for one reason or another. It's so horrible. Yes. And especially someone that makes us laugh, like the great Robin Williams, who recently passed. Oh, my God. That, that was so heartbreaking. I, I was so devastated. I was 
so, so devastated. Um, you know, he's uh, an incredible human being, gentle, kind soul. Uh, you know, we, we're we not perfect. None of us are perfect. Mm-mm. We all have our own demons. We all have our own afflictions and our own addictions. And, um, you know, back in the day, if you smoked, uh, it wasn't called an addiction. You just smoked. Mm-hmm. Now they have patches to get off of it. You know, when when you wanted to stop and, and you just said, you know, I had enough of this. I'm going to start chewing gum. You just stopped. And, you know, they, they'd slap a patch on you or you got to go through all this, uh, the, this rigmarole. Um, uh, my heart just... Uh, just bled for him, and uh, I was I was so devastated, and and it scares me because it's you know I've I've dealt with um, many clients of um, family members that had taken their lives, and you know my thing is um, forgiveness, like we have to forgive them, and I know there's a hurt there, like. Is this something I did and didn't do, mm-hmm. or you know, could I have seen this coming? And absolutely not, because I don't think they even saw it coming. Yeah, it was last year when I I, I helped. I guess you could say I helped raise a little girl from the time she was just a baby to seven years of age. In 2000, her mother and I uh, we went our separate ways, and it was just last year when I started having these. Re- reoccurring dreams of her and it was like she needed me for some reason so i reached out to her on facebook we reconnected we were going to meet up she was born september the 27th so she had just turned 20 and she took her own life just weeks afterwards oh my god and i was just telling myself you know because i've had these dreams before where i'm being sent a message yeah but I don't understand what it is until it happens. Yeah. And I wish I knew how to decipher these things. Yeah. It's like, you know what? It's like a puzzle and and you have to follow each piece. And I know exactly what you mean. I know exactly what you mean. You know, it's like, um, I follow every lead and I connect everything together. And it's, um, and and I think, and you know, in your case, like we say, well, well, why didn't I do this sooner? Because you weren't supposed to. You weren't supposed to. You know, the message was brought to you to do it now. Um, you know, to reach out and and to say what you need to say. Um, but it's like a light switch that goes off on them. It's a, that's exactly that's the only way to put it. It's a it's a switch, and no one can stop it. I don't think, I don't believe that Robin Williams planned this. Um, I, I believe, you know, he was um, up for a movie part. He was uh, negotiating. You know, you don't sit at a table negotiating and going back and forth. And, and I've been at those tables, and I know what it's like. And and I know the gruel, and I know the, you know, it's like, well, we'll get back to you, and then it goes on for months. And, uh, you know, lawyers, who's away, and who's doing this, and then, you know, it's uh, the, the pitter-patter of, like, the slowest feat ever um, when it comes to signing off on a dollar. So, mm-hmm. you know, he was doing this, and um, it, when you, if you were to have this um, on your mind, uh, I I don't think like you would really give a rat's ass, you know. <laughs> yes. You would probably be like, yeah, whatever. You would go with anything. You would think, exactly. Yeah. You'd be like, I don't really care. I'm gonna end it soon. Yeah, so just yeah. whatever. I mean, yeah, exactly. You don't have to sit there and say, nope, nope, nope. I'm going to do this and and study lines and get out there and you know research your your character and you know, try to come back with, um, you know, this, uh, this knowledge where you could ask for more or do mm-hmm. whatever it is you have to do. Um, and he was doing this. So uh, I, I do believe that um, he was 
suffering from depression, but not everybody who suffers from depression uh, has this light switch um, and mm-hmm. says, this is it. Some people don't have to. Um, but I, I do believe it had something to do with the medication. Mm-hmm. That's what I believe as well, mm-hmm. because that's, that's what happened with Hannah. Oh. She, she was told, uh, she got something she was supposed to, I forgot exactly what it was. She needed something, so this random guy that she knew gave her, said this was so-and-so, and and it it ended up being like Xanax or something, and she took it, and within, I guess it was that Saturday, October the 12th, where uh, her mother found her hanging. Oh, my God. That is so, that is so, so horrible. That is, it's, it's just, it's so sad, and, you know... People don't realize, like, Xanax is, um, like, medications, uh, you know, are good for what what they're needed for. And, you know, you you have to watch also, but there are some underlining um, conditions with that. You know, if you suffer from any sort of, let's just say, underlining bipolar, um... You know, we're, we're like I said, our minds are not perfect. Uh, we we're not wired perfect. There's something wrong. If you, we want to use the word wrong, um, with all of us, our thought process isn't always what it should be. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's a fact that if you take that and you have an underlying condition of any psychosis, any, it could even happen, it could even be a chemical imbalance, you know, and what do women run on? We run on hormones and chemicals and, and, and men too, but mostly women, right? So that, that drug could um, actually work against you. Mm-hmm. Now, Jackie, I know that you wanted to go for 45 minutes, but we haven't gotten known to your TV shows or your books. Do you want to take a break, get some water, and maybe come back, and we'll get to those? Sure. Um, I could. I, I don't need the break. I can I can just grab a, a drink while okay. we're talking. Okay, that's perfectly fine. I didn't mean to, for it to go like this, but the conversation was so interesting that... No, Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, and I'm so I'm so sorry to hear that. Oh, yeah, that, that broke my heart. Like I said, for the first seven years of her life, I was there with her, and she called me daddy because th- that's oh. what I was to her in a way. I wasn't yeah. really involved with her mother, but it's like her mother would say later in a book that she wrote that if you didn't know otherwise, you would believe I was her father. Wow! And it was because of that little girl I found out that. You don't have to have a child to love a child as though she was yours or that person was your child. You know what? Absolutely. I absolutely agree with you. Um, You know, William, my husband, raised my daughter, and um, he would die for her. It's it's his daughter. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's his daughter. And our dog is his daughter. (laughs) (laughs) I understand that. Yeah, you know how that is, but it's you know it's that is such a, a heartbreak. I I worked with um, and a lot of people, you know, I find this really strange. It's like they they have a hard time saying that word, and and I know it's um, it's horrible because when we think about like how we fight to live, and life is life is so beautiful. We can change anything at any time. And we can become anything, mm-hmm. um, you know, just by working at something and having the time. But to take that away from yourself, you know, I'm, I, I myself um, am dealing with a, a client now who is in hospice and she's very young. And it's, um, it's, it, it just kills me every day. Mm. Uh, to see the deterioration, and um, unfortunately, this is my life dealing with these things. But, you know, when when we see this, um, and people don't want to say what happened, and it's almost like this shame around the person, and I I find that to be a very heartache. Um, And I've worked with um, somebody... 
uh, who took his life, and he was an incredible uh, paranormal investigator, and he also worked for the court systems, and and he helped me on cases, and we worked in, with Fangoria together. And when I heard he took his life, I could not speak. I could not move. I was completely devastated. Mm -hmm. That will do it. That will certainly do uh, it. Yeah. yeah. What w would you recommend for people who have loved ones who committed suicide? Is there anything we can do to help them move on? Are there any prayers, anything we can do? Yes. You know, um, I believe in um, creating this, um, I, and I have seen it because I've been there myself, and uh, going into a deep trance uh, to astro travel. And, you know, people think that it, it can't be done. I, I taught Ronnie DeFeo in prison how to astro travel, mm. and um, he gave me answers, and everything was recorded. And the warden was there to um, to see that it was being done the way it should be, and and camera crews, and you know we um, I, we need to get them out of you know and and I describe it as in this book that I am writing now, um, we'll we'll just call it mirrors for now, but. Um, it has to do with my memoirs uh, and, and how I was faced with different things uh, in growing up. So uh, I came across uh, somebody, it's, it's funny how this turned into talking about suicide, but I came across as a, a very young girl I, going to school with this other girl um, who uh, tried to take her life because she was also gifted. And and trying to help her out of this, and she was in a coma. We were teenagers at the time, and trying to help her out of this, I had to go through this sort of maze. And it's like a Pandora's box, and that's where they lie. It's, it's one foot in between. And, and I think by keep creating what they loved and what was around them and what you know of them, uh, for instance, uh, we know, you know, Elvis loves certain things and, and you create this and you close your eyes and you start building this house uh, and you put yourself in there and you bring them and you need to go through every door. There is a process and the process is and, and could be dangerous because you're both facing your nemesis. And to show them that it wasn't that difficult. Mm -hmm. And then freedom is, you know, facing your fears and, and letting go and walking through that door and chopping down that dark forest and, and coming out. And you can do it by taking them by their hand with practice and leading them out that door. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned Ronnie DeFeo. You have a book out oh. called The Devil I Know, yes. My Haunting Journey with Ronnie DeFeo and the True Story of the Amityville Murders. What yeah. exactly happened? When you started to research this, what did you find? Well, you know, it started back um, when I was a child. Uh, I wasn't sure of this face that I saw come through my wall. And... I, it was just a huge face, just a huge face of a man that I did not know. This was in Louisiana. Um, I, my, my brother had, uh, he was supposed to be babysitting me and he had some girl over and I screamed and he ran in and he saw her. We all saw her and we went running and years and years later, you know, I, our paths kept crossing, and, and just like you said, you know, how do you know how to follow um, the, the lessons of a medium or a psychic through, like with these little pieces of the puzzle? And I kept putting these little pieces 
um, to the side, to the side, until I created, you know, um, this this whole picture that was in front of me, and it was in black and white, and now it was in color, and, you know, um, when my own life paralleled a lot with Ronnie's, hmm. and um, my mother had passed during an exorcism uh, that took place in Brooklyn, in, in this hotel in Coney Island, called the Surf Hotel, and while interviewing Ronnie, um, which I had no plans on doing, but on interviewing him, these thousands of hours, um, he started talking about the Surf Hotel and selling drugs there and, and being there and laughing and being in Louisiana, and he went to these places, and and the the book and the interview that many times I, I sat back and said, is it is this worth it? You know, like all these things are happening to my family, to myself. I knew I had to, to go down that road with him because of what happened to my mother, because of what happened to myself. I either either I face this this devil or I'm not going to be able to make it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the book takes a lot of twists and turns. And, um, well, we're we're proud to say that, you know, Universal um, had bought the rights to the book. And um, as of yesterday, it went into its first pitch meeting. And it's, um, I think it's planning to be, I can't say too much about it yet, but it's it's planning to be a mini series. Oh, yeah. So so that that was quite exciting, you know. Um, it's very true um, to to the story to the book. Um, while I was working with Ronnie, um, he signed his no other way of putting it his proxy over to me uh, for his health and his care. Uh, in return of giving me the you know the the true story and i and I often laugh and and you know when people say um you know they went to the house and and they have this true story you know and honestly there's only one person who has the true story mm-hmm. he's the only one alive let me ask you this was there truly demonic entities involved, or was it more just Ronnie DeFeo? that he was having issues that he had not dealt with and he went and murdered his family? That's a good question. You see, when when I first um, thought of this, and, and, and I had no intentions of doing this, I was doing a totally separate show for A&E. It was called Medium P.I. The captain of police was there at the time, at the time meaning he was the captain at the time, not retired. And everything, we were on the South Shore. I've never been there before. We were diving for a deceased child. And, you know, I say this a thousand times over. I, I, I didn't, like, this is, this is hell. When you see a child like that, this is hell. Mm-hmm. And I just knew, um, like, I remember bickering and saying, you know, this is, like, horrible. The parents are right here, and, and, you know, you're pulling a body up like it's a plank of wood. I hate this. I hate this. And all of a sudden, I heard these shotguns, and I thought it was as, you know, the people weren't happy with us around the surrounding area of those those houses and estates because, this had to do with drugs, and it was a teenager and, and so forth, you know, so they wanted things kept a little quiet, and we were bringing it out into the surface, and the cameras were there all the time, and people were getting a little itchy, but something kept pulling me into a different direction. And needless to say, um, it landed right in front of Ronnie DeFeo. Mm. And the, the, I don't want to give too much of it away because it's, it's so intriguing um, that I stepped back and, I, and it takes a lot for me to step back and say, what the hell was that? <laughs> you know, and I, 
I mean, he made me face a lot of my demons. You know, I kept it quiet about my, you know, how my mother passed away, and it was it was during an exorcism. Um, th- there was many things I kept quiet that I came, uh, you know, right out in the opens with. Um, but uh, to your answer, you know, um, before I came face to face with him, before the things that have happened to me happened to me, I I would have just said, you know, this was a spoiled brat on drugs. He needed his ass warmed. Throw him in the service. You know, do whatever it is you have to do. Um, but absolutely not. Hmm. Absolutely not. Um, I I think I think the only thing that could you know that could have happened differently was no matter what house they moved into, it would have happened. It just so happened the devil wanted to put the South Shore on the map. Hmm. And 112 Ocean Avenue, no matter what you do, no matter what you do, will be the most notorious place. You can change the address. You can change the look. You can do whatever it is you want to do. It happened It was with him. It still sits beside him. It comes in and out of him. And yes, they did. Um, His parents did go to Canada. The arbitrary, they brought priests back, and they were conducting an exorcism, and Ronnie hid between the walls of the house. Mm. Wow. I had always wondered about that because, you know, the current owners and other owners, they said nothing has happened in that house as far as they're aware. Yeah. So it's really connected to Ronnie DeFeo himself. Is that correct? It's connected to him. And I believe that um, things have happened in that house. There were other circumstances. There was, um, I I don't remember um, offhand, the name of the the family, but um, there was a teenage boy. They had a teenage boy, and they had purchased the house, and um, he seemed to be okay, and he started uh, getting sick, and they wanted to move, and he took his own life in that house. Mm. So he was saying that there was something, you know, in there. There was something in there. But you know the way people flip houses now? Um, and they say nothing uh, is in there. I, I, I think, you know, I think things tend to sit dormant. I think it wants people to think, um, when I say it, the, you know, the dynamic force wants people to think that, indeed, these things do not exist. Mm-hmm. And I've also heard that if a house, if there's something haunting a house, or something resides in one, and nobody lives in there for a long time, that they kind of go dormant, as you said, because they're not able to drain energy off of anyone. Yeah, and they pick and choose. They pick and choose, you know. Um, they'll they'll wait um, and see if they get the right person. Um, who can make a big splash? Who can be the next headline? You know, they, um, the, the force of evil... Uh, comes in like a storm, and they want to make sure it leaves a huge impact. Mm -hmm. And you have another book out. Let's see. It was just released in March, I believe, of this year. Yes. And and where you're talking about the Zodiac murders, it's called The Haunting of the Gemini, a true story of New York's Zodiac murders. Now, that's something that's always been of interest and interest to me and to a lot of people. Yeah, that is... Hedy Berto, that was Hedy Berto Setter. Um, and uh, there's another fine example of the devil knocking at your door. Uh, I, you know, it's funny because it's almost as if, you know, the devil is right behind you, pen in hand, saying, get this down. And, you know, he's not looking for... Uh, I don't know if the right word is star, you know, like started and like they want to become the star. Um, 
there's nothing like that. You know, I think Ronnie gloats over it and eats, it and eats this up, but the Zodiac Killer, he's nothing like that. He's, um, he's cunning. He's, uh, he's very quiet. He doesn't care. Um, he's completely different, um, completely different than Ronnie. And then here we go again before um, he started his killing spree. He went to a church. He's the, the Bible-toting serial killer and who wore a mask and turned into something. And um, it's, it's almost as if the devil puts people in certain places. And, you know, a lot of people don't want to see that, yes, indeed, that there is a darker force out there and it's very powerful because we only want to believe in the good force mm-hmm. um, that shines down upon us. But you, you have to, you know, people have to realize that, you know, you, you can't, you cannot have light without darkness. And, and only, you know, in true darkness will you then see the light. Um, so this war has been here way before us. Oh, yes, it certainly has. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, it has. We don't own it, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's, um, you know, Eddie is a very unusual case. He um, he believed he was the sole collector. And hmm. like I said, he went to the church and and he pleaded with these priests that there was something inside of him, something that would keep him going. He no longer needed food to sustain himself. He, he, he knew things he shouldn't know. He knew how to read um, hieroglyphics. He knew how to write it. He woke up with this knowledge that uh, most people don't have. He knew how to make guns and bullets. Um, and, and we have to remember there was no Internet at this time. So, you know, he was very cunning and he he was into uh he just knew how to do these spells like um the old solomon seal and twist it around and and get you know there's a protective solomon seal and if you flip a coin you know like anything else um there's a danger to it Mm -hmm. and he would he would practice this and you know the the priest told them they couldn't help him and they let him go, um, but they did visit him after the spree, and um, they they said they there was nothing they can do. And at the time, they were both young, and I did um, go see them, and they told me that um, they couldn't speak about it, and they feared that they were not strong enough to to deal with what what was inside of them. Mm-hmm. That's a shame, really. When someone tries to go and get help from priest or whoever, and there's nothing yeah. they can do or they refuse to help them, that's a shame. I totally agree with you because right after that, um, he, he just committed some of the most horrible acts, and, and he told me he would prowl the streets and something would just, you know, this dynamic voice would just say, get that one, kill that mm-hmm. one. And he would try to fight with it. And he it overcame him. And he just, you know, he went and he did it. And there was one time he was in a park and this prostitute uh, came over to him and he said he felt this uh, rage building in him. And you know, he didn't want to hurt her, and he growled out, um, run as fast as you can, and she did, you know, um, and he leaped into a tree. So when we see these supernatural powers and people, um, when the forces are that dark and they're able to do certain things and have the knowledge of, of these these things that um, people sought out their whole lives, uh, we need to to know that it's there 
and 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 really face it and and in facing it can we only conquer and and facing him and you you know the the strange thing that I found about this was that he was in the park he was in Highland Park which was like equivalent to like Needle Park at the time you know the heroin uses and he was preying on these you know poor souls that were afflicted and they were all lined up on the bench and he was sitting right between them Eddie never drank smoke did drugs um you know he was the the cleanest probably serial killer out there um was a fanatic about his own body um nobody was worthy enough to really touch him at certain you know it was like that that one prostitute and then he went crazy um the cops had a sketch of him from this prostitute hmm. and it was a really good sketch and they went from person to person and he said there was about 35 people lined up on the bench it was a hot summer night and they were scattered all around and he said that you know he knew the voice told him that he was going to be protected because his deeds weren't done. See, his plans were bigger. Mm-hmm. He wanted to blow up the um, Empire State Building, and he had the map of that. And he had bigger, grander plans, and someone had this for him. So they they come to him now with the sketch, and they freeze, and then passed right over onto the next person Mm -hmm. and nobody connected anything and that night he went on to another killing spree and then this one detective had a clue just had this really like creepy feeling and went to the projects and he was having nightmares and feeling like he was being pulled there and he he gets there and he waits outside for him and it's funny because it's like, how do you know he didn't leave already, you know? And he knew he didn't. Something told him he didn't. And he followed his gut feeling and his intuitiveness. And he gets there and he grabs him. And Eddie has the gun on him. Hmm. And he brings him down and he books him. And they throw him in a cell. And Eddie told me, he said, I felt like this was it. Like, my shit was over. I was caught He said, that voice came back and said, you're going to get out and you're going to finish. And he got on his hands and knees and he was fighting this thing. And he got up when he heard the keys coming and he said to him, the fingerprints didn't match and the gun was a child's toy type of gun made. And they gave it back to him and that night he shot Patricia Fonte mm. with that gun. Mm-hmm. They said it didn't work, and his prints never showed up. That it was a toy gun. They said it was like, you know, it's like an imbecile made it. It was nothing. It was like, you know, just a little, just a little piece of metal that didn't even cock back. Mm-hmm. And yet somehow and it he, killed some, someone else. So. Yeah, absolutely. And they gave him back the gun. And he walked outside the precinct. He cocked it back. It cocked back. And the bullet was right in the chamber. And he went about his business. And then they put this poster up of this African-American guy who absolutely had nothing to do with the killing spree, had nothing to do with anything. Uh, the New York was on a war hunt and... It was like, hang the witch. They went after him. They tried to burn him out Mm. of his apartment. Um, He snapped, apparently, like he was fired from his job. He was uh, in isolation. He was hiding. He was in down alleys. He was living off of garbage. He went onto the Long Island Railroad, got a hold of a gun, and he became the Long Island Railroad killer. Ah, so they kind of created him then. Exactly. Exactly. So you tell me, like, these things, you know, when people say, 
uh, oh, that's a coincidence. It's, I don't believe in that. Mm-hmm. I don't believe in that. This man, you know, he, he worked hard. He did this. He did that. He did, you know, he was just a, a, a working stiff. And he snapped. He had nothing. Mm-hmm. And his face was plastered all over. And to this day, to this day, they're not sure which person gave that description. Huh. But it was, and, and he, not only that, but he was on the other side of New York. Mm-hmm. You know, we have all different boroughs. We have Brooklyn and Queens and Manhattan and Long Island and Staten Island. You know, like, uh, like how did this happen? Mm-hmm. It almost sounds like another manipulation from a demonic entity. Absolutely. It was like, now we got the Long Island Railroad killer, where he just went on a shooting spree and, and killed so many people. Mm-hmm. And when I questioned Eddie about that, he giggled. You know, he said, you know, it's true that, you know, the, the greatest trick is to think that he doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Just as good exists, so does evil. Yeah, and a lot of people, a lot of people don't. They don't believe it. They just want to live their lives with that. This is all there is. Yeah, and and you know, I went through this whole revelation myself, and like, why? You know, I I try to like as you, you know, you said like earlier, you try to run from your gift and and just push it back and hide it. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I wanted nothing more to do with the, the crime, the criminal side of these things. And, and it just kept coming to my door and coming to my door. And, and the letters and the phone calls, it, it would just never stop. And these are notorious people. These are, you know, like the Night Stalker and, and Dahmer. And, and it, it just didn't stop. And I, I started seeing this woman that... I was seeing her way before I even knew Hetty Bertha was Eddie, uh, you know, mm-hmm. and, and she was one of his victims until not only was, she, was I seeing her face to face, but I started living her life. I, wow. she, she possessed me and, and I roamed the streets as her. I was his victim talking to him. Mm-hmm. So mediumship and, and, and what we do is, um, is, it's not just physically dangerous, it's spiritually, um, you know, we need to be protected and, and know how to, um, I was going to say shut the door, but they can get under the door. <laughs> <laughs> when a person is possessed, such as yourself, mm-hmm. and once this spirit leaves, are there lingering memories from this possession as far as memories of being killed this other person's life oh absolutely absolutely it doesn't when when i am able to release it um i there is a part of their life it's like a journal it goes right into my book um into into a book um and put aside and, and I often leave little relics for them and um, charms or something that they liked uh, to, to make peace with them. But it absolutely stays with you. Um, and even when um, I'm taken over fully, there's, I, I still know how to, I still know what's going on and I know how to control and I, I'm sort of scared of saying that because yeah, I don't want that, you know, I don't want to lose that. But um, Jackie is still there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's sort of like uh, you're a ghost now, though, but you, but you uh. are there. But I do allow the entity, um, the, the spirit, of course, you, you know, because these people were victims and they're, and they're good. Um, I allow them to show me and to reenact and to act out uh, their last moments or whatever it is they want to do, I allow it to happen because Mm -hmm. that is the only way that Jackie will know what I should do next or how I can help them. Have you ever had a time where a demonic entity tried to possess you? Yes. 
Yes, it's like um, it's it's like a horrific rage. Um, you know, I I keep my my faith firmly to the ground, and I call on to my spirit guide, um, and I. I'm able to, with the help of, um, you know, my, my my daughter is gifted, uh, to pull myself out of it. It's difficult. It's like getting in the ring with Mike Tyson. Mm. It's uh, it's not an easy thing to do, and especially that I have seen it happen to my own mother. So yes, I wouldn't want to get in the ring with Mike Tyson, not oh, unless hell. I had a taser. Oh hell, yeah! I know. <laughs> At least <laughs> be prepared. Yes, definitely, definitely. That's what that's what I've been told by some of my friends when I've told them about the entities that I've encountered, especially doing this show, doing all types of interviews with people who say they they're haunted by demons, etc. Yeah, I don't know if it's the entities that's haunting them or that when I do a show with them, it opens me back up again, but afterwards i swear it it always gets worse after a show like that yeah probably because it's like it, it knows you're there it's like you know hey um they, you know i can i can have some fun with this guy and uh, i'm going to show him how much i can do and mm-hmm. and of course it's torturous i mean you know who wants to keep going through that but we get that all the time you know the um the intercoms go off in the house and um, you can hear a child's voice in there, but you know, with with working with um, with Eddie, um, something that I I never thought of happened to me, and and it's in the book, and maybe this is why they kept gravitating towards me, these serial killers. Hmm. But I found out. Um, and I had the privilege of going back into my past life and finding out that um, I was a very young child killed by a serial killer. Wow. So maybe they, they, everything is so parallel, like they know, and it's like, well, we, we didn't get you that time. Maybe we can get you goat this time. Mm-hmm. Or maybe you came back to try and... Venge. Yeah. Or, yeah, or or even solve other similar murders. And that's what I have been doing for 23 years. <laughs> yes. You, you know, when it happens to me, especially at night, I, I just get aggravated. It doesn't scare me so much as it pisses me off. Yeah, I, I, I do know what you mean, because it's like, that's like, that's your haven. That's like <laughs> your downtime. That's your sleep. That's, you know... Um, that's the one thing where we're most vulnerable. Mm-hmm. The and, one time, you know, that and taking a shower. Yeah. <laughs> it's I, like, why? <laughs> I will get up and I will s- say, I'm like, if you want to mess with me, mess with me when I am not trying to sleep, because I will kick your yeah. ass. I, I actually say yeah, that good. I shouldn't, but. Yeah, no, but good. You know, you, you have to, you have to have this temper. You know, I, um. One of my, my life journeys was that um, I was a missionary for quite some time, and I recorded, part of my, um, my job was to rec- record and to bring back the facts, if it was true or not, if it was dynamic or, you know, psychiatric, or if it was, you know, what, what is this miracle taking place, you know? And um, it, it's, I still have all these relics um, in my house, you know, packed away. And it's, um, it's frightening, mm-hmm. you know, uh, to, to see that these things indeed happen. But um, I, I do take the stand like, you know, uh, cursing and leave me the F alone and get out of here <laughs> and, you know. Like, I had enough of you today. Well, what is it? Or the scariest thing is, like, never ask it, what is it that you want, you mm-hmm. know? Because <laughs> obviously it's you. Yeah, that's what a lot of ghost hunters will do. They'll get on their uh, audio recorders, mm-hmm. what do you want? No, no, I don't I don't like that. And I don't <laughs> like agitating, you know? Yes. 
I don't I don't like the uh, the shows that you know I have a, a deep respect for the dead um, you know because uh, eventually uh, we're all going to be in the same place and and their stories need to be told um, and and energy doesn't die it just you know, changes changes form and takes shape, and so you know, I don't like the banging and the hitting and and the hollering. I I think it's um, a little disrespectful. Mm-hmm. Also, I think it's disrespectful. Also, uh, I'm just from my own perspective. When I hear female voices shouting at me, just screaming, <laughs> like, and, and and I think it's my wife sometimes. So I'll go check up on her. She's okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I don't, uh, I don't go in for the, um, the way, you know, they they handle things. Or, you know, um, I was watching something the other night, and I think it had something to do with it was a commercial that came on, um, uh, like going breaking into these uh, insane asylum type of places and. Um, you know, there's there's such heartaches around these places, mm-hmm. and and such sorrow, and you know, laying in the morgue and being pushed into the drawer, you're you're mocking their death. Exactly. You know, and it's uh, it's it's a very sad thing that we take that as entertainment. Exactly. Nowadays. I think the one you're talking about is Ghost Adventures or something like that. Yeah, and yeah. I, I never did like that show. And the main guy, Zach, whatever his name is, he comes across as more of very, an entertainer very, and an idiot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree, and and it's very, it's embarrassing for the true the true investigators in life, and uh, you know, trying to solve something or or communicating or having the evidence to communicate. You know, but to to say, I demand. You know, um, I don't. I don't think, from my experience of, uh, you know, recording truth, true, true paranormal, and um, having these evidence and being involved in, um, you know, so, some very very frightening exorcisms and. Um, I, I, I do not think that any dynamic force would come out and smack you or pull your hair or your pants or whatever it is that they're saying is happening or bang on a wall, which is probably a PA in the back doing it. Um, I don't think they would come out when you demand like that and say, show your face, I demand I think they would wait in you till you're in the car on the highway, and then they would get you. Mm-hmm. I've said I demand, and you know they normally don't show up. They're probably hiding, <laughs> laughing at me. Yeah, exactly. They're they're just sitting there saying, "Well, aren't you something? Aren't you the hot shit today with the TV camera on you demanding?" Yeah, I'll get you when you're sleeping. That's when I'll get you. <laughs> yeah, well, that's. That's you know that's the truth. Um, it's and and that's how these things usually happen. It doesn't happen on cue. It doesn't happen um, you know when the camera goes on and 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 I think the audience is fooled by that. Mm-hmm. I was actually reading a book recently. I won't mention it, but it was also by a, a real ghost hunter, not not someone who goes around with electronics. Right. But this person was saying that. They went into a haunted church or whatever it was, and it was obviously haunted, but even with their ability, they couldn't get the entity to come out. Yeah. It, it, it won't come just because even if you have psychic abilities, it won't come out and just spend time with you. No, absolutely not. I mean, I felt the, um, in, in certain places, I felt the, uh, the rage. Um, I felt it try to come through me, and I was able to stop it as much as I could, and, and I don't go around with all that equipment, because when, when you are a medium and you are psychic, that is your equipment. And um, 
it's nice to have a tape recorder. I've picked many things up on just an old tape recorder, nothing fancy, nothing digital, just, you know, voice activated, put it down, said hello, and walked away, shut my door, uh, went out for several hours, came in and heard lots of voices, but I couldn't make them out. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't believe that, you know, and, and I believe what, you know, this person is saying because you can, they could feel the, the aviance of, of, you know, I'm sure of what has happened. Yes. And the energy and the heaviness or physical um, symptoms and also mental, uh, emotional mm -hmm things coming over them and what have you. But as far as coming face-to-face -face with it, no, that'll happen when you're at rest. Exactly. That'll happen when you're at ease and, you know, and when, when they want it to happen. Because we feel that we have control of everything when it's actually the opposite. Mm-hmm. You know, another thing that I've been reading up about you, I don't think I've ever actually watched the series, but in 2007, you were part of America's Psychic Challenge. Oh, yeah. That was wild. What was that like? Oh, my gosh. That was so crazy. Um, you know, at the time, I had this um, this female agent, and she was like, you have to do this, you have to do this, and... You know, I um, I didn't want to do it. Um, I I turned down a lot of TV and, um, and you know interviews when it has to do with um, you know something like that. I said this is like it's going to be ridiculous. And then when I found out that um, I had the opportunity to um, donate uh, money that for Katrina. There was a nursing home that I was concerned with, and there was uh, two animal shelters, and there was Covenant House over there that I'm a big um, fund. I do a lot of funding for and what have you. So I said, okay, you know, like, I can really help people with this and, you know, and I'll do it. And I really didn't want to do it because, like, I just had moved into my home and I wasn't really unpacked and and I don't like leaving my elderly pets and, mm -hmm. and what have you. So it was a strain on me traveling back and forth to California at the time. Um, but I was, I arranged it where I was working on a project um, and it had to do with um, a video game. So I was doing voiceovers for a video game, and then I would run from like that, doing that up in the hills to back to um, this American Psychic Challenge. And what I saw going on was like so much craziness, you know, um, just like uh, people trying to like get the answers out of you and... and um, uh, getting friendly with the with the guys and you know just everything I'm against. Mm -hmm. um, you know who was getting their hair done. I remember, <laughs> I remember having. Um, you have to wear the same thing because it's TV and uh, you know I was like oh I have to pick up two or three outfits like everything the same. So uh, I remember my assistant packing for me. And I had two left shoes. <laughs> I was like, holy shit. Like, you know, two left and, and two left flip-flops. So I was like, all right, this is like, I'm going to look so ridiculous. I'm always going to be stumbling around, you know. And I, I had these slacks and I am so bad with my wardrobe. It's like whatever is up front, I grab and that's it, right? But they they were ripped, so I had to staple them. And, um, well, I didn't have to. I could have went and bought, like, really expensive dresses. But my my thought was to, uh, my mindset was to every penny made was going to these places, to the Red Cross and helping the folks. So 
I had to staple them, and I was in a lot of pain because it, it ripped right off the backside. Mm-hmm. So I had staples every time I moved, uh, you know, puncturing my my butt, you know. So um, when they said, what's wrong? And I was holding the front clothes because the button was <laughs> gone. And I said, um, my pants broke. And they said, you mean ripped? And I said, no. I said, these were nine ninety nine. They break. <laughs> You know, there's no rip in 999. Yeah. <laughs> you know, these broke. So, um, you know, I was, I was, I was just devastated when the hundred thousand didn't go to the Red Cross because that that was my intentions, and mm-hmm. it was like I think I was like maybe two points under. I was completely devastated. I, you know, it was just so crazy and. I, I remember telling my assistant, I have to get a red eye back to New York and and just break the news to them. Like, I felt like I'd, I just let them down, mm-hmm. you know? And when I was boarding the plane, uh, it was like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and I saw these people in the airport. I was like, well, yeah, what is these people? And they were producers that were watching it, and they watched the the parts that the people, of course, didn't see, you know, and what was cut out and what was added in because I was the dark one, I guess because I have black hair, you know. (laughs) So (laughs) um, I was offered um, three shows right there, and one of them that um, I took was Medium P.I., that had to do with solving crimes. That's what I do best. And it, it, was, it was just so crazy because that's what, what landed me right in front of Ronnie DeFeo. Mm. But I guess everything was for a reason. But those, um, those producers, and, and I mentioned one in um, the book that I, I in the acknowledgement, um, She's also a director, and and she she sold um, the devil I know, and she's selling the she has the rights to um, the Zodiac Killer. Um, they wrote incredible checks out to Louisiana, mm. so I didn't lose. Yeah, <laughs> you just when you think you lose, it's like something comes, you know, and 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 gives you from another hand. Mm -hmm. I still had the broke pants. (laughs) I still had the broke pants and the two left shoes and everything else going on and running around in California and I just wanted to get back home and but the um I didn't let them down after Mm -hmm. uh, you know, after all. So that's that was my main thing. Do you have the broken pants, the two left shoes and everything up (laughs) framed somewhere? Yep. 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 Sometimes I didn't even shower. I didn't care about the makeup. I didn't, you know, I was there to do what I had to do, and and that's it. I was just thinking that it was quite remarkable, because if I'm not mistaken, I read that there, at, at the beginning, were 16 psychics, and you finished in the top two, a very close second place. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't even, you know, they would, there was one time, uh, you know, like, the lawyer to the show would meet you in the parking lot and it was at a crime scene and you know I can smell crime a mile away mm. and he you know I remember him telling me and I never told this to anyone I remember him telling me in front of people so it doesn't matter because these people know anyway that I said A, B, and C and he said right and I said no I didn't say that I said, I didn't say that. That's not what I said. I said, if you go back on the tape, I didn't say that. Mm-hmm. And that was my two points. Ah, so you really should have won. Well, I feel that I, you know, it's not that, it's, I don't even look at it as me that, that should have, but um, I was concerned because um, there was elderly people sleeping under the highway mm. that needed medication and oxygen. And 
you know, I, I, I was just like, wow, it's really like we live in a sad world. Yes, we do. You know, but some really good people who witnessed um, the events and, and were privileged to watch the show from the background on the set, you know, met up with me at the airport and, you know, just said it was it was announced that I was going to give the money to the Red Cross and, and to the folks that needed it. But they um, they gave the money. So I was like... That's awesome. I didn't care what I had to do. If I had mm-hmm. to shovel shit or, you know, dig my way through a tunnel or whatever it was, you know, I, I knew I had to, I knew I had to help. Mm-hmm. Now, I think that would be the last job I would ever try and do, though, shoveling crap. <laughs> that would not be a good job, especially in the middle of summer. Yeah, it, it wouldn't be good, but you know what? <laughs> I've done worse. <laughs> I've done worse. I've swam through canals and went through swamps, and um, yeah, I've done worse. I've had rabies. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah, I've gotten bitten by snakes, and you know, just I, I had my share. Yes. Well, Jackie, I've definitely enjoyed this time with you. Here, I do have a question for you, and if, at the end, I will ask you if you want to discuss anything with the audience. But right now. At the end of a show, I usually go and I'll ask a guest if time travel if time travel were real today, where would you go to and what would you do? Oh wow, um, I would probably I would probably go to the North Pole and would want to meet with Mister and Mrs. Claus and make toys. Mm. Because I really never had a toy. Mm-hmm. Wow. I bought I bought the younger Jackie a doll as I got older, and and I have a picture of the younger Jackie, and I give her tokens, and um, I actually found this like really special card, and and it was handmade, and it says memories on it, and it has little flowers, and I put that near that little girl um, who was standing near the seance table. Uh, at five years old, and I and I give her just like little music boxes and 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 tokens and little chocolates, and I help her eat it now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that that sounds nice. Now, before we yeah. before we do in this show, Jackie, is there anything that's upcoming? I know you've got a book coming out, and you've also got another TV series, I think, in the works or something. So. I would like yeah. to give you this opportunity to discuss anything with the audience. I would love to discuss, and um, I can only just say, you know, you're going to be at the edge of your seat, and it's um, what it, it scared me a bit. And uh, like I said, that takes a lot to scare me, but um, I I am not a privilege to speak of it right now. Um, I I know we're pushing for the fall. And it's one of those things where it's in negotiation uh, at the end of it. So, um, yeah, so I can't say too much. Is there... A, you know how it is. Yes. Is there a website you know, or anything? I get, I get in trouble afterwards. Oh, I know. <laughs> we don't want you to get in trouble. <laughs> I've been in trouble enough. <laughs> um, the, the website is um, JackieBarrett.com. Or the house that Kay built, and I kept that um, that website because it was um, it was put up really fast during Katrina, and homegrown, and it was um, at the time the Virgin Mega Store and um, Tower Records uh, sponsored me. Uh, you know, for whatever, how much I raise, and and they were, you know, hitting hitting that same amount. So I left that, but you can get the information off of either one. Okay. And your first book that you wrote, The House That Kay Built, yes. is that a fictional or non-fictional book? <laughs> That's, um, that was taking, uh, it, it's actually... Um, a lot of most of it is nonfiction. Oh, okay. And it was taken from 
uh, my personal diary when I had to travel to Peru and then uh, Kenya. So um, I, I put it under whatever you want it to be. <laughs> because <laughs> it's I know the people out there that you know know these things happen and and know what's true and know what isn't mm-hmm. and i and I sort of left it as that yes, sometimes a life story just needs to be put up out there, and don't say whether it's real or not real exactly because either if you say it's real, people aren't going to buy it. If you say it's fictional, yeah. people will be like, "Well, maybe it's real." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's sort of like that. There's there's a big mystery to Jackie, and and I think some things just need to be left as mm-hmm. that. I I think your theme song is "Mysterious Woman." <laughs> I have my own personal theme song. It's the Adams Family. It, it anytime I walk, that's what it is. <laughs> Oh, my God. Yeah, we've been called that here. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I certainly know that. Well, Jackie, I definitely love this conversation with you. Thank you once again, and I hope your throat starts feeling better. Yeah, it will. It will. I'm going to take some cold medicine now. Mm -hmm. But, Bob, it was was truly my pleasure, and your... um, you're you're an incredible interviewer, and I've had many of them, and it was like, oh my God, they know nothing, you know. But your your words hold a, a large impact, and and you're very wise. I appreciate it, my friend, and I hope to have you back on again. Oh, awesome! Thank you so much. Uh-huh, you have a great day. 